On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA has a plan to 3D print structures on the moon, the James Webb Space Telescope takes a look at Saturn's moon Titan, and astronomers warn NASA about the Deep Space Network's limitations. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. NASA is closing in on a deal that would give them the technology to 3D print the first sustainable human habitation on the moon. The news came on November 29th in a statement from a company called Icon. Their CEO Jason Ballard reported that a $57.2 million contract had been signed with NASA to fund Icon's extraterrestrial building research plan that they are calling Project Olympus. The plan involves developing feasible 3D printing technologies specifically for creating habitation on other planets. The plan is to use robotic missions with specialized rovers to prepare future sites on the moon and Mars for human habitation. On Earth, ICON has spent the last five or so years creating 3D printed homes. They are part of a wave of architectural companies using robotic cranes and armatures to fast print large portions of buildings. The process is extremely similar to the smaller scale filament style 3D printing that most of us are familiar with. A 3D dimensional design is loaded into the controlling program and rendered into slices of a particular height. On a conventional 3D printer, these slices are usually fractions of a millimeter thick. But for construction printing, the layers can be thick as a couple of centimeters. The exact numbers are changed according to atmospheric conditions like humidity and temperature. Then a robotic arm, which is rigged to operate on all three axes of movement, will trace the design, putting down layer after layer of the printing material according to the timing and layer heights the program tells it to follow. In typical 3D printing, we use various forms of plastic or rubbers. Even some metal can be printed with. But with construction level printing, companies like Icon use concrete. But regular concrete won't do the job in space. Concrete is normally a mixture of aggregate material, which is anything they can get their hands on, like sand and gravel, then combined with a limestone clay powder called Portland cement, and all mixed with water. The problem is that the process of creating cement is typically harmful for the environment. It produces a fair amount of greenhouse gases, and gathering the rock and sand material can strip mine whole areas of natural geography to produce concrete for developments in far off places. But the printing that companies like Icon use solve this problem in a way that makes their plan to print habitats on other planets much more of a reality. They use materials found at the site to create the concrete mix. They call this in situ materials, and it works by finding aggregate materials from nearby sources. This way, there's no chance of material contamination on the site, and there's usually plenty to work with. Icon is planning on doing just that on the moon and eventually on Mars. This idea works so well, mostly because transporting aggregate, Portland cement, and water to an off-world site would just be impossible. There's no way any rocket could ever transport enough of the materials to build a structure in a timely manner. It's just too heavy. But if we take regolith, the dust that makes up lunar and Martian topsoil, and use that to make the cementing material, then we'd only have to send the printing robot, right? Well, there's that problem about water. Typically, cement needs moisture of some sort to be able to become plastic or fluid enough to be laid out the way we want it. More than that, moisture is what helps cement to dry into the crystalline structures that are what makes concrete so strong. So, how is Icon planning on laying cement on the moon? Well, as research is still ongoing, it's pretty hard to find out what they are planning on using. But from a video on their site, it seems they've hit on a pretty ingenious way to overcome the moisture issue. They're going to melt the regolith. You can see in the layering process that the material comes out molten, which is incredibly smart. Lunar regolith itself is mostly silicon and iron in composition, so it would likely melt as well as sand does here on Earth. So it looks like the machine scoops up regolith, heats it to molten levels, and lays it out like a normal printer would. The only other tricky bit is making use of the right geometry to allow for complex structures in the light lunar gravity. On Earth, gravity is generally enough to keep simple walls from collapsing with a little bit of structure. 
Companies like Apis Core, for instance, lay down their printed walls with triangular sections inside the wall that are more than enough to keep the structure stable. But lighter gravity is trickier to work in, and while many materials gain more strength in low gravity environments, concrete might not work like that. We haven't done much work with concrete in that sort of environment, so part of this research grant will undoubtedly involve some testing in orbit. But aside from that, you can see from the videos that ICON isn't taking chances with Earth standard walls and is looking to build stronger geometric shapes. Whether that's actually necessary or not will have to be tested, but it certainly couldn't hurt. Aside from the research hurdles that involve materials testing and the configuration of the robots, NASA and ICON also have to figure out how to build the internals of any habitat made this way. 3D printing is very useful for laying down a hard shell, but that's all it does. Plumbing, electrical, lighting, ventilation, airlocks, windows, all of the things that make a space livable are going to have to be assembled in another way. But that's something that could even be handled by a crew of astronauts on the ground. The hard part is definitely the concrete, and ICON's system looks like it has a good chance of becoming a reality. It's also encouraging seeing NASA put up some money for this research. A big part of the Artemis mission philosophy is making our presence on the moon and beyond a much more permanent endeavor. But it's always hard to have faith in a project until some real funding goes out. If you've been scrolling on your phone a little too much lately, then today's sponsor Pinecone is the perfect way to put that time to good use. Pinecone is one of the top product review sites that pays people to give feedback about products and brands and get rewarded with cash and gift cards. What makes Pinecone unique is that they are invite only with exclusive opportunities and a guaranteed payout amount for every task you complete. There are even opportunities to test and review products, which is a very cool opportunity. Instead of mindlessly scrolling the internet, use that time to give feedback to Pinecone so that you can earn a little more while inflation rises, and you can put some extra cash in your pocket. Pinecone is invite only, so click my exclusive link in the description or pinned comment to start earning cash on Pinecone today. With the Artemis 1 mission taking NASA's full attention, the strain to Earth's ability to communicate with vehicles outside our network in low Earth orbit has never been more pronounced. The Artemis 1 lunar test mission is on the last leg of its 25-day mission, and during that whole time, NASA has taken priority of the DSM, NASA's deep space network made up of an international array of giant radio antennas that supports interplanetary missions. This means that little to no communication bandwidth has been available for other missions like the James Webb Space Telescope. The chair of the JWST Users Committee, astrophysicist Mercedes Lopez Morales, talked about the issue at a meeting of the U.S. National Academies of Sciences Board on Physics and Astronomy on November 30th. She detailed that NASA had warned the James Webb team that almost all of the bandwidth of the DSN would be needed to keep track of Artemis 1. It could be up to 80 hours, that's about three and a half days, of no contact with JWST at all. And while instructions sent to the Space Telescope are typically given on a weekly basis, the team needs to beam back the image data regularly before Webb's computer fills up. So to compensate, the JWST and the Hubble as well had their observation schedule shortened so they could fit their download times into the tighter schedule. And while this issue isn't that big of a deal at the moment, without a plan to expand the network, NASA and the teams that operate all of the deep space missions could be in for more disruptions as the Artemis missions begin scaling up. The DSN is currently run out of three facilities that operate a series of gigantic 70 meter radio antennas and some relatively smaller ones like the 34 meter dish installed in Madrid in 2021. These facilities are placed 120 degrees apart in longitude so that there's constant communication with our vehicles as the planet rotates. The facilities are in Goldstone, California, Madrid, Spain, and Canberra, Australia. But even with upgrades and additions, astrophysicists like Lopez Morales are worried that if we don't expand our communications network soon, then the rest of the Artemis missions are going to cause an unacceptable reduction in capacity for every other deep space mission we have going, and any future ones we're planning as well. For their part, NASA's Artemis mission plan includes the creation of LunaNet, 
a robust communication system for use around the moon. This system boasts a Delay and Disruption Tolerant Network, or DTN, that would allow data to reach its intended destination regardless of disruptions to the network by backing up the data at nodes, communication points that can act as relays. Satellites, landers, and the Gateway Lunar Station are all planned as nodes to be used by LunaNet. But until we get a functioning network like that up and running, we're going to have to make do with the DSN to run our cislunar missions, and that means our need for discovery will have to take a bit of a backseat for a while. Just before the real slowdowns in communication began for the James Webb Space Telescope, the team was able to share a very important bit of imaging with astronomers studying Saturn's moon Titan. NASA astronomer Connor Nixon of the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, Virginia, had been able to allocate up to 15 hours of inspection time for the space telescope to use its detailed instruments on Saturn's moon. As Titan is of particular interest to future NASA projects like Dragonfly. In particular, the James Webb was able to send back some very clear shots of Titan's atmosphere with its near-infrared camera, near-cam, and its near-infrared spectrograph, near-spec. These two instruments gave some incredible images that showed not only cloud formations over Titan's biggest ocean, but also the chemical compositions that could lead to signs of life. Titan is of particular interest to the search for life in our solar system because of its Earth-like conditions. Sure, it is a very cold planet, most of its landmass is water ice, and its oceans are liquid methane. But Astronomers have previously used images from the Voyager and Cassini probes to theorize that Titan has weather patterns just like Earth's. On top of that, with its high quantity of hydrocarbons like methane, it's a possibility that bacteria and other microbial life could make a living in the oceans and clouds, exactly like scientists theorize is happening on Venus. And the images from JWST confirm at least that Titan has weather patterns. One of the images the Keck researchers are really excited about shows a cloud formation over the Kraken Mare, the largest of Titan's seas, and further observations from the observatory showed other cloud formations in the same area. Given that the Mare is located in the Northern Hemisphere, which is currently enjoying a relatively warm Titan summer, they're pretty sure this is evidence of weather patterns forming. More data is still being combed through as the James Webb also used its mid-infrared instrument, MIRI, to look at the chemical composition of Titan's atmosphere. But all of this work is confirming the importance of this moon ahead of the Dragonfly mission, which plans on sending a life-searching drone to Titan in 2026. Until then, we only have the data that distant observations bring, but cloud formation and seasonal weather patterns is a very promising find. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.